Shabbat Shalom. You know, between you and me, coming of age in Judaism is not easy. And the timing of it all, especially if you're a young boy, we wait for the age that the voice is beginning to awkwardly crack, give him a three-note range, then we put him in front of the most important people in his life and ask him to sing in a foreign language in which the most common sound is <sighs> For those of you who know, successfully chanting the Torah requires a minimum of an octave range, well beyond the average vocal range of any non-singer. God bless our B'nai Mitzvah youth. The struggle, as they say, is real. Of course, chanting the Torah is not only a Herculean feat for our young adults. Chanting the Torah is actually an expectation for all who are able. But the question I pose is why? Why is chanting so important and how did this come to be? There are quite a few answers to these questions, but let's begin with somewhat of a Darwinian perspective. Around 510 BCE, Ezra the scribe, a learned man living in Babylon, decided to travel to Israel with a group of about 1,500 other Jewish people. But upon his arrival, he practically wept at the poor state that the Jewish community was in. He discovered that few people even knew the word of the Torah, so he took it upon himself to read it out loud every market day, namely Mondays and Thursdays. For these holy words to survive, he believed he needed them to reach the people where they congregated. It would be like reading the Torah today within the hallowed halls of Bloomingdale's. If you've ever been to an outdoor market in another country, you know that it can be fairly chaotic. Chickens are clucking, peddlers are peddling, there are pots clanging and artists chiseling, not to mention all the yelling and price haggling. But Ezra knew that would not be heard without adding some dramatic flair. He exaggerated the highs and lows and the contour of his voice production, and that became the beginning of a, music, a beautiful musical journey. So thus, a new oral tradition was born, known as cantillation, from the Latin cantare, which of course means to sing. And like most traditions, it has passed through generations as a sacred way to bring our text to life. In fact, it may interest you to know that his days at market were so influential that even today, in addition to the Sabbath, we continue to read Torah on Mondays and Thursdays. So from survival to adaptation, chanting soon became codified religious law. And in 50 of the Common Era, Rabbi Akiva, considered to be one of the greatest rabbinic sages, declared that the Torah should be studied by chanting every single day. And later in 279 of the Common Era, Rabbi Yochanan, a disciple of Hillel, contributed to the continued study of Torah by ensuring that its readers always use the proper musical chants. But, dear friends, the Torah has no musical notes, so how do we know the correct way to chant? As the Jewish people began to learn the sounds of Torah chanting, a series of hand gestures were developed to assist the Torah reader. Like a baseball coach giving their players physical cues, the different gestures matched different melodies. Upon seeing the jester, the chanting Torah, the person chanting, would know what the melody coming up was simply by a gesture. The system is called chironomy, and it is still practiced today by Yemenite Jews, a unique religious group separate from Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews who have been described as 
the most Jewish of all Jews, and the ones who have preserved the Hebrew language the best. But again, I'm fairly certain that few of us are fortunate enough to be Yemenite Jews. So how do the rest of us learn these melodies? Well, a group called the Masoretes, conservators of tradition, attempted to limit the act of memorizing the melodies and instead created 28 written symbols called te'amim. Think of small physical symbols that give us the flavor or the taste of the word, and ta'am in modern Hebrew means taste. It implies that the Torah reading is a three-dimensional sensory experience that offers us sustenance and pleasure. Te'amim are considered a very early form of musical notation. So over time, the melodies that matched our symbols would change, and today you can find the symbols in Torah commentaries that indicate which melodies are to be paired with which word, and these symbols very often vary according to geographic traditions. You heard our rabbinic intern Emma Dubin chant from a system called the Avery Binder Cantillation System, which is used in most Reform synagogues, you heard me chant the cantillation of Haftarah. So Avery Binder of Cantor Lawrence Avery of blessed memory codified many melodies of the Torah, and these melodies influenced our compositional choices. So let's begin with ancient love poetry. As it is traditional to chant before, during, and after a wedding, we begin with the Song of Songs. And when chanting this section in the Bible, the melody would sound a little bit like this. <laughs> Cantor Avery's composition is based on the traditional chants for this poem. The brilliant element here is how he inserts a processional wedding march into the opening bars of this melody, blending the antiquity of Bible chanting with the modernity of a wedding march. Here's this beautiful poem. Like a lily among thorns, so is my darling among the maidens. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the youth. You are a garden spring, my own bride, a well of fresh water, a stream of Lebanon. My beloved answered me and said to me, rise up to me, rise up to meet me. I saw you and all of your beauty, and I gave myself to you. Shoshana ben ha chokhim ken rayati ben ha banot ket ha puach patse hayar ken dodi ben ha banot Ganna <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
want to So in chanting psalms, there's a very specific system of notes that are called upon to bring them to life. The mode employed here is admittedly simple, and now and then a composer can be inspired by the simplicity. It's through their talent and musicality that they raise the text to new musical heights. Such is the case with Psalm 98, composed by Yechezkel Braun, a forefather of Israeli music. This is a gorgeous composition that offers incredible word painting. Listen for the phrase, Pitzchu v'rananu v'zameru, which means break forth, sing aloud, shout, praise. If you'd like to follow along, you can follow on page 59. Pitzhu veranenu, pitzhu veranenu, vizameru. Pitzhu veranenu, pitzhu veranenu, vizameru. Leave ne'er a 
Turning to our B'nai Mitzvah students, in traditional circles there is a special mode used when studying texts known as Lernensteiger. And though you may not realize it, many of you already know it. If you were to sing, for example, traditionally, the four questions on Passover, you would be using that mode. And if you were to chant the Torah blessings, you would also be singing in that mode. Right? Do you hear how those are in the similar sort of mode? Well, perhaps when Ira and George Gershwin were becoming B'nai Mitzvah, this modality firmly lodged itself in their minds because it certainly influenced what has become one of the most important songs of the modern opera, Porgy and Bess. The irony is palpable given that the melody we chant for the Torah blessings was somehow chosen to be paired with subversive and controversial lyrics that cast doubt on the veracity of the Bible. Surely this conflation cannot be a mere coincidence because songwriting at the Gershwin level was too precious an art to allow for that possibility. Perhaps the Gershwins were taking a subtle stab at tradition by using sacred music for sacrilegious thought, or maybe quite the opposite, that while we can poke fun at the myths of our heritage, we still know our roots, we still understand the core values of our people, and we still remember their practices. If I could ask you, could I just have a, a G to a D, please? Right? Pretty similar, right? Well, listen to this. It ain't necessarily so. The things that you're liable to read in the Bible it ain't necessarily so. Little David was small, but oh my. He fought big Goliath who lay down and died. Little David small but oh my why do Zimbabwe live yeah oh Jonah he lived in the world oh Jonah he lived in the world for he made his home in that fish's abdomen, oh Jonah, he lived in the well. Little Moses was found in a stream. He floated on water till old Pharaoh's daughter. She fished him, she says, from that stream. Why do 
Zimbabwe live in the water, scaly wild, yeah. It ain't necessarily so. They tell all you children the devil's the villain, it ain't necessarily so. To get into heaven, don't stop for a second. If clean, don't have no faults. Oh, I take that gospel whenever it's possible, but where? the grain of salt Methuselah lived 900 years But who calls a living when no God is given to no man what's 900 years I'm preaching this sermon to show it ain't Nessa, ain't Nessa, ain't Nessa, ain't Nessa, ain't Nessa.